any of these kind of hearsay things, people were doing this, people were doing that, people were eating this, people were eating that, fine. Believe what you want. But at the end of the day, what we need to get past, I think, is this cognitive dissonance of mindlessly regurgitating this idea that human beings are well adapted for plant intake, and in fact that's optimal, and we don't need any animal material at all, we can live very well on plants, because that's nonsense. Welcome to the Recovery and Transformation Podcast, the show that links personal health with societal well-being. I'm your host, Samir Dosani. I'm an activist, a PhD student, and a health coach based out of Johannesburg, South Africa. This show explores the root causes of disease and talks about how people are recovering and transforming every day. Hi, and welcome to another episode. My guest today, for the second time, is Professor Bart Kay. Bart is a researcher and has been a lecturer on issues related to sports physiology, heart disease, and nutrition for many years. In our previous discussion, I asked Bart about his career and how he ended up in his current position, which is that a 100% carnivorous diet is optimal nutrition for human beings. In this discussion, we talk about a number of other things. Uh, I was particularly interested in his take on exercise, and in the weeks since we recorded this, I've been putting his advice to the test with good results. What I like about Bart's approach is that it's pretty simple. It's not very time consuming, no long warm-ups, no stretching, just get out there, work at high intensity, and then get out of the gym and live your life. Now, before we begin this discussion, please do remember to like, subscribe, and check out the link in the description for a free ebook. With that, please enjoy my discussion with Professor Bart Kay. Well, everybody, welcome and thanks for joining us once again. Today, my very special guest is Samir. Samir, welcome, welcome very much. Thanks, Bart. It's a pleasure to talk to you again. All right. Let's start at the beginning and go through your story of how you came to where it is you are now as regards human nutrition and et cetera. But, you know, give us some broad brushstrokes. Give us the full story. Yeah, well, I mean, it starts in my my rebellious teenage years. I went to university. The short story is I grew up in a a bubble in Washington, D.C., which was a bubble in a lot of ways. I went to school with Rockefellers and, you know, Gores and so on. Like, you know, it's a very elite kind of a place and very stifling in retrospect. And when I got out to university in Canada, it was like the whole world opened up. And I got involved in sort of leftist activism and I started working at the anarchist bookstore in Montreal. And I got exposed to many ideas that I had never heard of, anarchism being one of them, leftism in general, but also veganism is one of the things. The way we used to talk back in those days was that there's sort of three fundamental pillars to the work that we're doing, women's rights, animal rights, and direct democracy. Yeah, I have my thoughts on how those things fit or don't fit together these days, but that's a different story. So I, I volunteered at naturopathic stores and so on. I did a degree in philosophy and learned how to argue a bit like the sophists we see on YouTube today, the vegan sophists. And that was fine. But, you know, my real interest was in actual, I like to actually get shit done. So when I went off and got a career, I was like, okay, how the, how the hell can we actually help people? Because there's all kinds of problems in the world. There are all kinds of people starving, for example, to give one problem. Can we actually go and empower farmers? Can we go and work with people? Can we actually increase food production? And I visited, I had the honor of visiting visiting um, poor farmers collectives, mostly in Asia, worked a lot in Indonesia, worked a lot in India. And when I met these farmers, they were all very happy to meet me and happy to have my help and advice and campaigning and advocacy and talking to leaders and crafting policy and so on. But when it came time to eat, we had a problem. I had very strict dietary restrictions and they were like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, that doesn't make any sense to us at all. Some of them just ignored me and some of them were like, whatever you're doing, it's not really helping yourself or anyone else. What are you talking about? And so that together with the fact that it was really, really hard to find vegan food in Manila, where I lived for a little while, basically meant that I was not This vegan thing was not going to work. So I I downplayed to um, lacto over vegetarian. And I thought that was a healthy way of eating right up until, so that was in 2000, 2001, right up until 2009, 2010, when my daughter was born. And then all kinds of problems started to happen. My wife, got Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, which is an autoimmune disease that you'll be familiar with. Mm. And we were told that it's very common and it's nothing to worry about. But in retrospect, it's like, 
Is it common for a human who's just given birth for the first time to suddenly develop strange autoimmune dis disease? The, the endocrine system is very sensitive, as you know, it's very important. Uh, if you want to produce more babies, which assumably in the wild humans would have wanted to do, do you really want to tank your hormones after the first pregnancy? Like it didn't make any sense. And other things started to happen. So around 2012, my wife developed some kidney stones. We think that there may have been a role in some homeopathic medication she was taking as well, but, but the, clearly the diet wasn't helping things. And then I myself, a couple of years, like 2015, 2016, it's amazing how long these things take. Eh? Things started going wrong about seven years before I actually figured out something is, is really going wrong. So I started to develop prediabetes and other problems. We talked about some of them in the last interview, some arthritis and poor night vision and so on. And then what happened in 2017, I got the chance to start a PhD uh, in South Africa. And instead of going to the library where I was supposed to go to, which is the anthropological library, I went to the medical library and read every paper I could about health and nutrition and so on. And I was pissed off. I was fucking pissed off to learn that everything I had ever heard about health and nutrition and diet and so on was dead wrong. Not only was it dead wrong, we had evidence going back like a hundred years in the peer reviewed research to show that it was dead wrong. That really made me angry. And then I started to think, okay, what can I actually do to do this? So in addition to my anthropology work, I did a health and nutrition coaching certification. And now that's what I do. I, I work especially with people like myself who were plant-based or vegan or vegetarian at some point in time, but I'm willing to work with anyone, especially people who want to reverse chronic disease. That's sort of my passion. Awesome. Very, very cool. So where are you now in terms of what does your diet look like? What does your family's diet look like? How do you guys approach this? So I've had my pure carnivore, I don't want to call them experiments, but they were like sort of time periods in time where I did 100% pure carnivore. And I thought I did pretty well on that. But just culturally speaking and so on, I think that it's a bit unrealistic for, for me and for most of my clients. So what, you know, the way I eat typically is my first meal of the day is my sustainer meal, I call it. Like if I don't eat a second meal, I'll be totally fine. My first meal of the day is around what most people would call lunchtime, like sometime between 11 and 1. In general, that'll be maybe six raw eggs and a shake, maybe a steak or a couple of burgers, cheeseburgers, maybe some cheese if I want it. If I feel like I'm at a maintenance weight or that I want to gain a bit of weight, there'll be some cheese in there. If I feel like I need to lose weight, then no cheese. That's the first meal. And then the second meal, I'm a little bit more flexible. It'll definitely be meat-based, and that's how my family eats. But if there's a little bit of low-carb vegetable or something like that, I won't say no, just for sort of cultural reasons. When I was vegan, I was a real pain in the ass, Bart. Really? Um, and, I've never heard of such a thing. <laughs> and I, I, don't, I don't really want to be a, as much of a pain in the ass if I can avoid it. Right. Fair play. Yeah. Fair play. So we don't need to collect your card. We don't need to point at you and say you never really were a carnivore and you did it wrong or to ostracize you from the community or anything like that. Yeah, what do you make of that part? I mean, there's been a lot of, in, in some of the Facebook groups and so on, there's a real purist streak. It's, I find it a bit annoying. I don't know how you find it. Like, uh, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think that extremism in the diet nutrition debate, I, I don't think it's helpful to anybody. People that make their name, make their self known online in this influencing community by means of how can I be more extreme than the next person? I, I don't think that's doing anybody a favor. Yeah, I agree. What I do know is that when I go through periods of time, when I apply a discipline to myself to be 100% carnivore for a transcribed period, I find that there is a vast improvement in my generalized health status, disposition, etc., associated with that 100% adherence, which then falls back to my normal, relatively reasonably healthy, apparently, baseline when I live a life that's somewhere between 90 and 95% carnival. So I get the personal situation, family situation, cultural situation thing. There are all sorts of pressures on different people of different sorts that lead them to make decisions to have a fallback position from 100% carnival. And many of those people can be perfectly happy with that and be apparently perfectly, for want of a better term, healthy. But I think they are missing the added benefit of 100% carnival. That said, I don't think all the different flavors of carnivore, the factionated, you know, carnivores who only eat raw, that doesn't add anything to our community. It doesn't add anything to the health status either. There's no benefit that's apparent. So that's nonsense. People who say you must eat organs, no, no, you don't need to 
eat a lot of organs or anything like that. People who say salt is rock and stare at sun. No, no not, not people you want to listen to. The people I think that you should listen to are the people who are reasonable, rational, and whose statements are based not only in anecdotal, real clinical experience and evidence, but you know also in some kind of, those people have some kind of scientific grounding as well. I think it's perfectly okay for the lay person to have a channel overtly supporting the carnivore diet, but we when these untrained, ill or even non-experienced individuals go off and start saying, no, no, we've got it all wrong here and now this is, I'm, I'm in charge now, This I'm the only one in the world that knows this about the carnival diet, you've all been doing it wrong and this is how you do it. I think those people are not helping us. No, I agree. I mean, I think there's a couple of things that you're saying, Bart. One is that, you know, I just asked the question to the audience, is this a religion or is this about helping people to heal and, and find the best version of themselves? Exactly. If it's the latter, then I think there's as many different ways of doing it as there are people. Although, point that the necessary intake of carbohydrate is zero, is going to stand for the whole species. Right? Yes. So, so there are certain principles that we can universalize. That doesn't mean that one of that doesn't mean that we can't individualize the approach. Let me put it that way. Absolutely. Yes. You bet. Yeah. Because we are all a bit different. Not as different as some people would have us believe. Sure. I mean, we are all the same species, but what works best for us individually in our own individual lifestyle based on the genes that we have, yeah, no reason why you shouldn't. Yeah. The way I put it sometimes, Bart, is that we're all, you know, in an ideal world, we none of us would have ever eaten the standard American diet. None of us would have ever been alcoholics. None of us would have ever had any uh, health problems at all, right? Because we would have been eating a proper human diet with close to 100% meat. But that's not the world we live in. Mm. And because we're all fucked up in individual ways, and we're all different points in recovery. And I've had become less dogmatic as I've learned this myself, because the approach that I was taking four years ago to heal myself doesn't work for me anymore. And I have to tweak it uh, if I want to continue healing. Mm. So I think we need to be open to the possibility that the person we're talking to has some knowledge of their own body. At least they have some knowledge of what they're willing to do. And therefore, as a coach, I can't say, can't have them go from zero to 100 necessarily overnight. We need to do things slowly sometimes. Sometimes people can do it. Um, sometimes people can't. Mm. So we have to respect that. Yeah, absolutely. No pointing and naming and shaming. No cancelling of your card as a carnivore. We got away with it. All right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah. There's another question I wanted to ask you, Bart, if you don't mind. I know you're you're interviewing me, but can I ask you a couple oh, please. questions? Please, absolutely. Go for it. So there's some research in the news. I'm sure you would have seen it a couple of months ago on taurine being this sort of magic amino acid for youth and so on. Mm. What did you make of that? I didn't, you know, to be honest, so much was going on that I didn't pay too much attention to it. I, I, I sort of glanced at the study they were talking about, and it didn't look like new information to me. Right. Um, but I don't know if you, I don't know if you had a chance to look at those studies and what you made of them. No, I haven't. I do have friends and colleagues in the space who are absolutely all about the touring. Love you, Harry. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sopranos, yeah. Yeah, Harry Sopranos. He knows all about touring. He's done hours and hours of review of the area and knows it inside out and backwards and he'd be a great person to ask about taurine and its benefits and he will wax lyrical for hours hmm. if you ask him okay given that there is a finite amount of space in an individual person's consciousness knowledge base stuff that i can keep together keep all the threads together understand really well and so i've been focusing in in this area not to say that things outside that area can't add some value in some way and i'm sure that taurine is one of those things that may well case by case have utility and i would absolutely think that anything harry had to say on the taurine issue is probably worth listening to However, I've been focused on putting a message forward for the last year or so, and I'm going to continue until it you know, proves that I need to and change it in some way. But I've been saying, look, there are five things people need to take care of in their lives. The five top causes of inflammation in human existence, human society, he says, and I'm talking Western society here. If we can take care of those five with some hacks, some interventions, that reduces a person's chronic systemic inflammation overburden to probably the 95th percentile. And what are those five, Bart, for those of us who haven't been paying attention? Well, the five are, if you like, a 100% carnivorous diet. The second one is a range of nutraceutical, supplemental, 
products from a company called Sorrel with whom I'm joint ventured and the products are involved in promoting the release of adult stem cells to the bloodstream and in reducing inflammation directly by another product which knocks down two separate pro-inflammatory pathways, the two that are most commonly activated in humans, as it were, um, all natural, not pharmacological, actually derived from blue-green cyanobacter mostly. One or two plant extracts as well in the product. I know, crucify me, but plant extracts are fine. Actually, we've been using them for millennia for medicinal and nutraceutical purpose. Um, what I'm warning people against is eating whole plants because they contain the toxins and things that will mess you up good. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about that, there's a link which I'll put underneath this video. You can go straight there, basically, and it shows you the product, and it's got all the research linked there as well. There's also a shop there. You can just go ahead and buy it. Uh, number three is to ground yourself electrically, which sounds like hairy-legged, crystal-waving, woo-woo, sad guru stuff doesn't it? And when I first heard it, I thought, what are you on? The person who told me that, I was like, what are you talking about? Ground yourself electrically? Are you nuts? Do you want me to start waving crystals around as well and all of that? Turns out there's really good science behind it. I was wrong. There you go, everybody. Write it down. There's an example of once when I was wrong. There was this other occasion that I thought I was wrong, but I was mistaken. So all of that said, yeah, just, just to quickly follow up on that, I mean, everyone should know that we are bioelectric beings, yes. and therefore the fact that we need to ground ourselves like any electrical appliance yes. makes sense. It, it, it seems, and there are those who are arguing from the pure and applied physics perspective, that our very existence is in fact an electromagnetic phenomenon. We are electromagnetic beings. We evolved electrically connected to the earth with our bare skin against it. The soles of our feet mostly. We also slept on the ground in caves on not very well insulated sort of things. We didn't build buildings and live in those that were insulated electrically. We certainly didn't have shoes with rubber soles on our feet. We didn't drive around in cars with rubber tires all the time and work in buildings that are similarly electrically insulated. It is unnatural for us to be electrically disconnected. The result of it is actually oxidative damage. It turns out that if you are electrically connected to the earth, you can absorb electrons from the earth directly into your body from the earth. And those electrons seek out, find and replace, i.e. plug holes left in oxidatively damaged tissues, etc. By basically saying, well, here's your electron. Came straight from the earth. We absorbed it into our body. Well, look, there's a hole. Goes in there, sorts the problem out. Uh, so that's actually the evolutionary design for antioxidant effect. That, and we've got a suite of antioxidant enzymes, molecules, a master suite of antioxidants that we actually produce ourselves. It was never a biological design for us to gain antioxidant effect nutritionally from plants. Never. Not in our history as a species. We are supposed to get our antioxidant effect largely from being grounded to the earth. There are also a bunch of other benefits to being grounded, some of which occur immediately, and I'm not going to go through them because of time, but there is a video on my channel called In Five Minutes or Less, and it's all about the studies that support this thing, or, or purport to at least. But I'll give you one example just for fun. The second you are electrically grounded to Mother Earth, the effective viscosity, thickness of your blood decreases, your blood gets thinner, by a factor of three. That's so fascinating. That's incredible, isn't it? So you, basically, effectively, you're reducing the work required of your cardiac tissue, your heart, to pump blood around your body, all else being equal with vagal tone, etc. You're saying to the heart now, okay, this, this fluid is now a third as thick as it was before. Enjoy. Much easier work. And it makes sense when you think about, you know, again, the role of blood as a conduit for electrolytes and the, the, the bioelectric system and so on. There's some logic there, but I'd be fascinated to learn more about that. Yep, we'll go and have a look at that video in five minutes or less. I think there are something like 19 different studies which get splashed up on that screen, Mick the Vegan style, with no real discussion, of course, because that's what you do. You just say, look, here's a paper, and here's another one, and look, here's another paper. And it's very exciting. Um, but certainly you can go and read all those papers and go, oh, that's interesting. Expedited wound healing, normalization of aberrant cortisol profiles, increased delta and decreased alpha brainwave activity. I could go on. Yeah. So grounding is a great thing. You should be grounded to the earth. The fourth of the five is to block blue wavelengths of light, especially artificially produced ones, from your eyes, 
So once the sun has gone down below the horizon, it's night time. You should not be looking at blue things, usually the cause of which is artificial lighting, computer screens, television screens, all of that. The easiest way to achieve it is to put on blue blocking, dark amber colored lenses. Not clear ones, not ones that purport to be these computer glasses that don't distort your color vision but block blue. Well, that's interesting because if you block blue, that distorts the color spectrum. And what you will see is amber for the wavelengths that need to be blocked. The net negative color is amber, dark amber, not clear. If you put on these clear glasses and you can still see blue, it's not fucking blocked, is it? Okay, so I'd get that done. Questions on that? Can I play, yeah, can I play devil's advocate on that one? Because I've, yeah. I've but what I've heard secondhand through other so-called experts on the internet mm -hmm. is maybe that matters a little bit, but what matters more is, is getting a good dose of your blue light sunlight when it's actually out. Sure. And if you do that properly, you know, the studies that purport to show a benefit from these lenses were often done with, you know, college students who were kept away from the sun all day. Mm -hmm. And then, and then this blue light blocking thing seemed to make a difference in sleep quality and sleep wavelengths. And I don't know what all they measured. Yeah. But if you if you're a normal human and you're making an effort to get out in a day, that probably matters a lot less. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and step number five that is on my list of things that I usually say to people, here's what you need to think about and pay attention to, is the right amount of the right kind of exercise at the right intensity, the right number of times per week. And you're going to tell me exactly what that is for everybody. Uh, right. High intensity burst repeat activity and or resistance training. Whole body split three or four times a week. In other words, every other day. Um, 30 to 45 minutes from start to finish at or you know close to your absolute maximal effort. No moderate zone activity. Really get after it for 30 to 45 minutes every other day. That seems to have massive effects on inflammation and etc. And the way that you've said that, it could be lifting heavy things or it could be something like sprinting. Absolutely, okay. yes, either or. Okay. Yes, but not okay, both cool. on the same day. You certainly don't want to do both on the same day. Well, you could, I suppose you could do upper body and sprints on the same day if you wanted to, but I'm not sure. You'd yeah, but I'm usually purporting to most people for most intents and purposes that a whole body split is the best way to go in the gym. So you, you wouldn't have an upper body split or a lower body split or a push-pull day or anything like that. You'd have, you're doing every muscle group in your body with a single activity of very high intensity. Probably two, if you're talking resistance training, probably two working sets only, six to eight repetitions with the heaviest weight possible that you can lift that many times. Um, and what I would also usually do is superset those. So you'd probably have t 10 to 12 exercises on any given day. You'd start at the top of your list and work your way sequentially down the list. One set, and then you'd go to the top of the list and repeat. Cool. And then you're done. No sitting on the bench, no sipping water, no looking at who looks good in Lycra. None of that. You're in there for to get this done and then get the hell out of there. And are you a believer in, in the value of zone two or not really? I absolutely avoid it like the plague. I think it's a very, very bad idea long term for a person's health prospect long. Based on my understanding of exercise physiology, I can tell you that most of what you hear from exercise physiologists about the so-called need for this zone two volume training is totally false. Absolutely unscientific. It's based on fundamentally flawed models of how exercise, energetics, cellular energetics, muscle energetics even works. That's fascinating. So but that's probably that's probably a discussion for another day because that's a whole discussion all by itself. Yeah, but now I'm I'm tempted because now you're you're suggesting changes to my own workout, so I'm tempted to push you a little bit on this if you don't mind. Sure, you can absolutely. So what I'm, you know, the way that I do things and it, it's working well for me so far, but maybe I should tweak it is that I go to the gym three to four times a week. I do something like what you're suggesting. So the weights is going to be full body training mm. reps to failure as much as I can. Mm. But in the beginning, I do 30 minutes of zone two. Mm. When I first started that, it seemed to seem to make me just fitter overall. What I do now is after the zone two, I also do some sprints, mm. definitely do like a good five, six sets of sprints and, and then I'm done. Mm. And sprints are, you know, 100% like as, as fast as I can possibly go. So we're talking between 20 and 30 seconds, not more than that. Right. Cool. And then walking to, you know, walk. So I'll, I'll sprint for 30 seconds. I'll walk for a minute and a half, that kind of thing. Okay. But you're saying I, I might be able to maximize things just by maybe stretching and not doing the zone two stuff. The way I approach training when I'm doing training 
I would start with five minutes maximum of zone two so-called work. And that's purely just to warm my body, to put some heat through the muscles and get them ready to become more elastic and less plastic so that the risk of me injuring myself when I'm doing my high intensity workout is lowered, so-called. So I'm going to choose something like, because I'm doing a whole body split, I'm going to choose something like the concept rowing erg or something like that as my warm-up kit. So I'm going to jump on there and I'm going to do five minutes of rowing at the middle upper end of the zone two training. So I want to get some heat through my muscles. I want to get a bead of sweat on. I want to raise my heart rate and respiratory rate to get me ready for the activity. That's my warm up per se. In terms of stretching, not a fan, depending on activity, etc., and required ranges of motion, power output, concerns, all of that. But in general, for most people, for most purposes, stretching is not only not helpful, it actually seems to be a bad idea. So I'm not going to be doing stretching per se. What I am going to do is I'm going to select, if I'm doing weights, I'm going to select a weight that's around about 50% of my 1RM. And I'm going to lift that 15 or 20 times with perfect form, making sure that I'm focused on the feeling in the joint, the feeling in my segments, the kinesthetic feedback, making sure, and using mirrors as well, making sure that my form is spot on. Then I'm going to rack that weight straight away and do my first working set. So I'm going to go straight to the heaviest weight I can lift eight times from that 50%. So there's a big jump there. I've already worked through the range of motion. My muscles are warm. The risk of injury is not going to be decreased by me having done some stretching. In fact, the risk of injury might actually be increased by me having done that. So straight to that heavy weight, eight reps, rack that weight, because I'm not going to do the second set at that stage. And then I'm going to go and get my 50% weight for my second exercise, do that, do the first working set. Then to the top of my list, second working set, straight away, straight back to the same weight again. No warm-up set the second time around. Done. In and out of the gym, if I'm doing it in the gym. I mean, I also do a lot of stuff around the house here with really very, very basic equipment. My own body mass, my weight, one or two free weights, mostly dumbbells, a bunch of different elastic band modalities, including the X3, which is a great bit of kit in terms of um, it does what it says it does when used in the right way, etc. I think it's something that could be in people's home exercise gear. It, there is one here in the house and I've found it useful in a number of ways, etc. I've also got a bunch of other elastic band things that aren't X3 or X3 generated things as well. So I've been using variable resistance for some time as a, as a, as a training methodology. So what I'm hearing is that um, for my sins, I still listen to Dr. Peter Atia, yep. who puts a, put a, puts a big emphasis on zone two training. And what I'm hearing is that based on your reading of the science, that's completely unnecessary. Peter is wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, and, and let me clarify that because it's a big thing to say somebody else is wrong. Let me, so let me justify it a bit. There are many different ways to skin a cat. What we are interested in here is the outcome. When you're doing physical training, what we are looking at at the end of it, the reason we are doing it is because we want a specific physiological capacity as the outcome, a specific form of fitness. People are often asking me, what should I do for general fitness? There is no such thing. General fitness is a construct, it's an idea, and it's a fallacy. All fitness capacities are explicitly and very definitely specific to task. Am I saying there's no bleed across? No, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that if you're training for a specific event, the best way to train for that event is at the intensity that would be required of you on a competition day. The idea that you need to do miles and miles and miles, hours and hours and hours of so-called training at an intensity well below your competitive intensity and add at a volume and duration far longer than your event, absolutely ridiculous and false. The only thing that I've heard people say as an argument supporting it that has any basis in even what you would consider to be common sense would be they say, oh yes, but a lot of zone two training is involved in helping you build higher numbers of mitochondria and larger mitochondria, allowing your oxidative capacity to be better, which is great until you understand that that is a specific physiological response to a specific training pattern. That is your body getting used to running hours and hours and hours, miles and miles and miles at a low intensity or a relatively low intensity to your maximum. Now, we know there's a relationship between the time over which you can endure an event and the workload at which you are working at that time. So 
the harder you work, the sooner it will cave you in. Goodness me, that's shocking, isn't it? I bet you've never thought of that before. It's this whole adage of, as you train, so shall you perform. If your training is long and slow, guess what's going to happen on race day? Well, if it's a, if it's a marathon, you might do well. Well, not really, because a marathon is long and fast, actually. I mean, when you look at the speed across the ground of elite marathon runners, let's look at the world record. You know, he, he's running at something like 22 kilometers an hour. Now, anyone that doesn't know what that is, go to a gym somewhere that's got a treadmill that goes up to 22 kilometers an hour, set it to 22, and away you go. See how long you last. What we have there is an extreme efficiency of movement, an idealized body composition for that event as a result of that person's training. And let's face it, it's a generous hand in terms of the genetics involved. Just to sort sort of to get to the the punchline of this discussion, mm. I had a slide which maybe I'll put in the the thumbnail of this video or something, or I'll put it on the on, in the in the comments, which showed the difference between the physiology between a long distance sort of an ultra marathon runner and a sprinter. And in general, most people. So if you're if you're competing in marathons or ultra marathons, it's a different story. But most people want to look like the sprinter and not the marathon runner. Yeah. And the marathon runner has a fair bit of intramuscular fat, which is actually, it's a useful adaptation for that particular yeah. purpose. Yeah. We also know from people like Professor Tim Noakes mm. that they are also, they can develop diabetes, they can develop heart issues and so on at a pretty bad pace because intramuscular fat or those ad- adaptations for the long distance running. And so the point is that for most of us who want to lose fat, for most of us who want to optimize muscle, you want to train more like the sprinter than the marathon runner. Have I, am I, am I on the same track as you are? Pretty much, yeah, pretty much. And in, in terms of what's most likely to be of utility in everyday life for a human being living in a Western society, high intensity burst repeat activity is far more likely to be useful to you than the ability to run a marathon. There's no use for that in everyday life. The only reason that you would ever train to run marathons is if you want to run a marathon. You wouldn't, you wouldn't say, I'm going to train for a marathon for my general fitness because there ain't no such thing, as I said. It's a specific training ability. And of course, it turns out that training at an intensity well above the zone two, the idealized training zone for cardiovascular effect, it turns out the training above that also elicits the same adaptations or very similar ones. So the argument for it evaporates even before you look at why their model is completely wrong in the first place. Yeah, in retrospect, I think... You know, looking at my own journey, I think zone two training was probably helpful to get me from like sedentary doing something, like it played an actual role. But now that I can do stuff, I probably like it probably not doing anything for me. I could probably just go to the straight to the lifting weights and sprinting and get the same kind of effect is what I'm hearing from you. Yeah. And let's say you want to have a baseline ability to let's say you're a jogger for your main training modality. And let's say you want to be able to jog 5Ks as your minimum fitness for running capacity for some reason, then all you need to do to maintain your ability to run 5Ks is once a week run 5Ks. Not 6Ks, not 10Ks, not 15, five. But do that as fast as you can every single time you do it. And that will maintain your ability to do that. If you are a 10,000 meter specialist competing at 10,000 meters level, and you better train that. Then that's where you should train. You should train at a speed that you can maintain for 10K, i.e. your competitive speed. Or you should train by running faster than that, which will cave you in quicker than 10 Ks is up, necessarily. But you should never, ever, ever train below that intensity because, well, for a bunch of reasons, but one in particular is that the speed of running is very, very important in your brain deciding which motor units to select, which muscle fibers to select to do the running movement, the cyclic activity of running. When you train a motor unit, any one given motor unit, by means of training your body as a whole, when you train that motor unit to be active at a lower power output, speed across the ground in the case of running, the reason that happens is because that those muscle fibers physically morphologically and biochemically actually change. They are trainable. So what I'm saying is a fiber which tends to be at the glycolytic end of the spectrum, which would be a bigger fiber, a more powerful fiber, a a more quickly fatiguing fiber, necessarily because of the differences in muscle fiber morphology and 
stuff. Sorry, forgive me if I get the terminology right, but type 2B? Yeah, there, there, are, there are touted to be three different muscle fiber types. These are just categories. This is not that there are three different muscle fiber types and never the twain shall meet. This is a continuum. And the muscle fiber types are just a means of grossly morphologically describing the differences between the muscle fibers. Any muscle fiber existing anywhere on that spectrum can be trained to actually become smaller, less powerful, more fatigue resistant, or larger, more powerful, more quickly fatiguing. So if you train at 60% of your competitive intensity, two things are going to happen. Number one, your physiology will be optimized for running at that speed, which is absolutely useless to you on race day, because you need to run 100% of your competitive intensity to win if you have any chance of winning in the first place. And secondly, your muscle morphology will move that way to support that. So you won't, yep. you won't have optimal performance. The other thing that also happens is all of that training is a cumulative fatigue burden, which just breaks the body down and prevents sufficient recovery time for you to optimize your training response. Fascinating stuff, Bart. Thanks so much for sharing this stuff. Can I, have you heard of the, the Comrades uh, Ultra Marathon that we have over in South Africa? Yeah. So um, I don't know if you know this, but uh, Tim Noakes told us that the, the coach who trained the, people who, the pers- people who finished first, second, and fourth, and the people who finished first and second both sort of beat the, the previous record this year. Okay. They were all, by the way, they were all on, a, or the coach, I don't know, because they're not saying things publicly. Yeah. But the coach uh, is an advocate of, of purely carnivorous diets, and the participants were filmed, you know, eating steaks, you know, the day of the race or the day before the race or whatever it may have been. Do we have more evidence about elite athletes who are using this uh, way of eating as a boost? There's a rumor that the All Blacks were using it. I, I was involved in a cursory way with the All Blacks preparation for the 2011 World Cup, which they won. And I can tell you that at that time at least, so over a decade ago now, there were at that time three current All Blacks who were carnivore and who were not singing it from the rooftops and telling everybody about it. Precise reason being, number one, they could do without the pushback from people. Tough rugby players can't handle a bit of lip. And secondly, they felt that it was giving them such a performance boost, such a a boost in their energy and their power and their strength and their explosiveness on the rugby field that they wanted to keep it to themselves. They didn't want others to know about it. And I can also tell you that having been involved with a number of both sub-elite and actually elite professional sports people and people in highly physically demanding physical occupations such as military, policing, firefighting, etc., that the carnivore diet is more highly represented there in the top performing athletes and participants than we are led to believe precisely for that reason. This is, their, this is these people's secret source, if you like, their, their performance boost, and they want to keep it to themselves. So, of course, they're not singing it from the rooftops. The same is true of training at an appropriate intensity and reducing the volume vastly. People say to me all the time, what, what do you know? Well, actually, I'm a well-published exercise physiologist, so I do know a bit about it with a couple of decades of experience teaching it at university level. Uh, secondly, I've dealt with elite athletes myself professionally over the same sort of about 20-year period, and I am acquainted with quite a few of them who are doing things that you don't know about. But these people will still come to me who maybe have done some running and say, oh, there are no serious runners in the world who don't train for volume at low intensity in zone two. What what are you talking about? This is the way to do it. It's always been done that way. All the coaches are saying it should be done that way, so it must be right. Well, number one, just because this is the prevailing idea in exercise physiology about how it should be done doesn't mean that is actually correct or optimal. It's just what has, it's just what holds sway. And secondly, the assertion that there are no serious world competitive athletes who are training at the right intensity and volume is false. There are. They're just not telling you about it. Why would they? It's funny because I was looking at I was trying just for, I can't remember what I was trying to do. Some, I, I think a client asked me a question and I was trying to research how Usain Bolt trained. Mm. And what I found was that all of the videos, all of the, the, I couldn't find any interviews or him talking about how he trained until after he was no longer sort of interested in running a specific event competitively, right? So he only talked about how he trained for, say he, he broke the record for the 200 meters of, only after he stopped 
competing for that particular mm. length of race, yeah. was he willing to talk about how he trained for it? Obviously. And now, whatever he's running for now, he's not going to tell you about how he trains for that. Mm. So it's, it's uh, you know, I think you're 100% right that this is all sort of closely guarded secrets. Absolutely. But I mean, the, the other thing we must not forget here is once again, while Mo Farah has some genetic gifts predisposing him to being very, very successful in medium to long distance endurance running, Usain Bolt has a pretty good hand for being a sprinter genetically up front. So there is nothing I could do, even in my prime many decades ago, that I could have done to match Usain Bolt. There is no opportunity for me to get anywhere near him because that's just genetically disallowed for me. So again, we need to be cognizant of that as well. Sure, sure. Genetics and, and training are both going to play a massive role in this. Bart, we only have about five or six minutes left for this uh, for this discussion. I wanted to ask you a couple of things that were really sort of plain devil's advocate, you know, because mm. what we hear from a lot of people, I, to be honest, I think the naysayers kind of know that they're losing these days and, and um, they're getting, their arguments are getting more and more silly. Mm. But there are a couple of arguments that I do think it would be worth at least, at least mentioning, uh, if not debunking fully. Yeah. Yes, we have the example of cultures who ate a lot of meat and who were sort of meat-based, but they weren't almost all of them, we can argue about the Maasai warriors, but maybe with that exception, even the Inuit were trading and trying to get some plants, trying to get some plants into their diet to supplement mm. their diet of uh, whale and seal blub blubber and so on. Mm -hmm. What do you make of that argument? I wasn't there. I don't know for sure. I can't say, well, that's absolute rubbish. No, not at all. I suspect that Inuit were trading with people from further south, and I suspect one of the things that they did trade was an amount of plant material of some kind. It seems pretty clear from all the archaeological, anthropological, and genetic studies that there is a clear population-wide knockout of a certain set of genes which lead to a number of adaptations physiologically to both cold and carbohydrate devoid diets over millennia and millennia. So uh, that's where I would start my tension. Any of these kind of hearsay things, people were doing this, people were doing that, people were eating this, people were eating that, fine. Believe what you want. But at the end of the day, what we need to get past, I think, is this cognitive dissonance of mindlessly regurgitating this idea that human beings are well adapted for plant intake and in fact, that's optimal, and we don't need any animal material at all. We can live very well on plants, because that's nonsense. That's 180 degrees out of phase with the objective reality in which we find ourselves. If we look on a population basis at human beings, we find that those on a plant-based diet suffer. It destroys their health sooner or later, at large. Now, there are one or two outliers who are able to withstand such self-abuse for years before they actually finally do crap out in a major way, sure. But all we can do really when we're talking to people about the, the likelihoods of the masses is to talk about the middle range with an understanding in mind of how variable the data is around the mean to give us an idea of its power of prediction, because that's usually poor as well. That's for another day. At the end of the day, it, it looks, when you look at the human system objectively and with actual science as your illumination rather than theology, what you will see is that the human body is very, very well adapted to a diet consisting of the muscle meat and associated flesh of large ruminant animals mostly. And other animals can be added in, of course, for variety. A balanced diet of animals. That's what you need. About 80% beef is great, it seems, for most people, and 20% everything else seems to be an ideal diet. Muscle meat, again, let's, let's focus on that. It's muscle meat I'm we're talking about here, not organs. Absolutely, you can eat some organs if you like in a small amount. You don't need to, and certainly don't overdo it with things like liver because there can be some very serious issues if you do. We're not designed for that. That's not our evolutionary path. We, we evolved on eating the muscle meat largely. So that's what you should do. It's interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to finish a short article about Homo erectus, one of our ancestors, mm. and how it sort of co-evolved with um, mammoths and mastodons. Homo erectus was probably our most successful ancestor. Mm. They were there for a whole long period of time. And they really, wherever you find Homo erectus, you find these elephant, elephantine bones, mammoths mm. and mastodons, and so on, mm. depending on which, where the population was. 
So it's fascinating that different species co-evolve with each other, so, you know, the ruminants and the grasses and so on. It seems like we at least partly co-evolved, uh, not just with ruminants, but also with like elephants. Fascinating. Well, humans would have followed the, the herd of Mastodon around. Yeah. Of course they would. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the herd's on the move again. Let's move our camp so that we're near enough that we can strike out and take down a mammoth when we need one. For sure. And then you think about how many people a mammoth. Those things were much bigger yep. than modern elephants. Sure. You think about how many people that could feed. Wow, that's a that's a whole lot. Yeah. Bart, it's been a pleasure as always. I think we better we better call it here. All right. Uh, look forward to chatting. Hopefully it won't take us another year, but look forward yeah. to chatting again soon. Right. I'll have my people contact your people in due course. Uh, these are my people, of course. Ted, you, you're acquainted with Ted. He's in charge. Um, all right. We'll talk to you soon. Fantastic, man. Love, yeah. to, love to Ted and, and, uh, and all of yours. Ciao. See you soon. All right. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Professor Bart K. For more content like this, please do check out my website, samirbasani.net. With that, I'm Samir, and I'm a health question and anthropology student. I'll see you next time.